Welcome on Earth Day 2021 to our latest Dream Big for Europe conversation in the Together Ensemble series. Julie Gagan and I are very pleased to welcome Stephen Quest, the Director General of the European Commission's Joint Research Centre, and Dave Snowden, the founder and chief scientific officer of Cognitive Edge. He's best known for developing the CUNIFIN decision-making framework, which draws on research into systems theory, complexity theory, network theory, and learning theories. Recently, the Joint Research Center has published this EU field guide to managing complexity and chaos in times of crisis, which is inspired by the CUNIFIN framework. Julie. Today, we want to have a discussion about our current times and what we need to do. And I have a question for you. So over a year ago, we were expecting to be in lockdown for two weeks. Why do you think we are not yet at the end of this crisis? I think, I mean, there's probably three or four things. First of all, nobody got it right anywhere in the world. Right? Because all government contingency plans, and if you look at the process of assessment and response, assumes you have a crisis and then it's over and you can focus in that time. Now, what COVID did, and it wasn't that we hadn't gained it in some environments, it's the plague scenario. Um, because of worldwide connectivity, because of the fact that you know lockdowns happened, didn't happen in a coordinated way, they happened in various different ways, we suddenly got hit with something. Um, I think we need to recognize two key aspects of this. One is we actually, as a species, did quite well with it. You know, some of the scenarios I was involved in around the plague of this nature involves sort of mass breakdown of civil society and everything else. And we've managed that. I mean, there's lots of things we could have done better, but fundamentally, we didn't do badly. Pe people were on board. They trusted to a degree their governments. They worked forward in that sense. I think the other thing, and I've said this in a few forums, is that we need to look at COVID as God's gift to humanity. Because this isn't the worst plague we're going to see in my lifetime. And I was 67 a couple of weeks ago. And we got the big thing of global warming and everything else coming. So the reality is we're going to be in a series of waves of crises of different levels and different scales, really for the foreseeable future. And one of the reasons we sat down and wrote the field guides, you know, starting last year, is we need to start to rethink the way we structure interactions between governments, officials, politicians and citizens to handle that type of environment. Maybe building on, on, on what Dave's been saying, I mean, the what's clear is that, I mean, we've gone through already multiple crises because we've had COVID, but before that we've had other crises that we've had to deal with. So I think that this... You know, I know it's a bit of a it's hackneyed now, but it's the new normal. But we have to accept that that going forward, things are going to be different. Um, what what that the reflection I have on that is that we we need to adapt the way that we do leadership accordingly, because the the if you like the old way of doing things isn't going to work um, going forward for the reasons that they've set out. I mean, this is not the last crisis or the last uh, you know pandemic we're going to face even. So. You know, how do we take the benefit and the, and the learnings of this crisis and, and adapt our leadership models accordingly? I think that's the really deep challenge that we're facing. Um, and it's, it's, so that's one of the reasons why we, why we brought, um, you know, we work with Dave and, and the colleagues on the field guide is precisely to provide some, some uh, sort of toolbox, um, some pathways uh, for, for, for policymakers to use in navigating these very difficult waters of crisis uh, and, of, and of chaos in a more in a in, in a better way. So, uh, you know, uh, of course, crisis is difficult and uh, uh, you know destabilizing. But I think we have to take the the upside of the crisis and say it's 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 not just a wake up call. It's actually a, a sort of potentially an accelerator for us to get into a better way uh, of doing policy, um, and that that actually might give us some really quite good you know, advantages and, and possibilities going forward. And for me, the great news is we, there, are, there are good things that we can do in the here and now, and we know how to do it. It's just a question of exercising those muscles in a different way uh, going forward. Um, and hopefully uh, the elements in the field guide and other aspects of our work will, will support policymakers in, in making the shift. Uh, the, the risk I see is if we don't make the shift, 
then we have a problem. You, I mean, Stephen mentioned this idea of we need to change a little bit the way that we, we work. Well, it's not necessarily a little bit. It's quite a fundamental change. I think where we're saying is there's a huge amount that we currently do which works, but maybe it needs to work differently. So let's take two key principles from the field guide. Leadership is actually about coordination, not, make, not decision making. That's one of the mistakes people make. The reality is, in a crisis in particular, you have to distribute decision making to the level where people understand the consequences. Yeah? And your role is to coordinate that, not to make all the decisions. And that's also important in terms of your ability to lead, because if you make the decisions, you're going to make a lot of bad ones. You can't avoid it. So I think it, it's this sort of switch. It's not that we have to change everything we do, but we have to change the focus of it and change the way that things interact. And, and this new leadership, Stephen, is it a leadership which is only at the top of the organization or of the system? No, I, I will, uh, no, absolutely not. I mean, if it is, then we've got a real, <laughs> we've got a real problem. No, I mean, I think, I mean, it's a bit what Dave is saying. We need to I encourage, I mean, what I would call a more distributed leadership. I mean, the leaders at the top, uh, you know, I, I think, you know, the challenge for leaders at the top is to transcend the individual and the in the sort of classical view of a leader which is somebody who as dave says sits at the top makes all the decisions got their name on the door and you know likes to play god uh you know to let go of all of that and to liberate the energy into the organization where things can be done most to the level where things can be done most effectively um and that for me is one of the big learnings uh, of this of this crisis i mean i can see it in within the the joint research center where, where in order to respond to the crisis we had to adapt our ways of working and to distribute responsibilities differently to enable people to respond sufficiently rapidly to the to the demands and the pressures that were on them so we it was like an organic response but a command and control system won't won't work with that so so leadership has to be distributed through the organization a lot of this is about very small changes all focused on getting feedback much faster from more diverse sources because the big problem leaders have and remember i talked with a national security advisor in the states about this and he said the problem he had is every time he asked for advice people competed to have their advice accepted not to tell him what he needed to know and that's true of all leaders so the, the, you know, the project we then did which you know, Stephen and his group picked up, and that's why we wrote the guide, is how do you, it's called disintermediation, how do you make sure that leaders have direct access to raw data in a form that they can actually accept so that not everything goes through multiple filters before it gets them. So this is a deeply pragmatic kind of like, this is the way we evolved to be, let's work with it. Yeah, but let's actually not disrupt the current structures, let's find ways to feed the current structures much better data. In the uh, comment that Stephen was making about distributed leadership, okay, you, you've managed to do that within your part of our overall organization. But looking more broadly at our overall organization and even wider than that, all of the different institutions, because each of them have different roles, then um, how do we manage that or how, how do we manage that organic approach to? But let's take an organic metaphor, right? If, if you look at a fertile field with trees, right? The thing which makes the trees healthy and the soil healthy is the fungal roots, right? So there are fungal roots which extend 500 times further than the tree roots. They interconnect all the trees and there's some very sophisticated communication going on there we're discovering, yeah? Um, and they provide effectively water and nutrients and they get suckers in return. So take that as a metaphor, the trees are the formal system which will always be organized in silos. You will never get rid of silos. Yeah, the first person to complain about this is Solon the tyrant of Athens. So yeah, if we haven't found a solution since him, we're not gonna find one now, right? Um, actually the way silos work, and I remember doing work with Jeffrey Robinson in NATO in Brussels, and the way that NATO made a decision is everybody would get together and have a ferocious fight and they'd all disappear into the corridors for a week and have lots of informal conversations. Then they come back a week later and make a good decision. And I remember saying to him, that works because what you're doing is you're putting all the commodities on the table in the initial confrontation, and then people are finding ways around it. So building informal networks is critical. Yeah? Um, and the informal networks, you need to design the process of their creation because they don't want to be based on 
oh, I went to the same Grand Ecole as that guy, yeah, or I worked on that project with that person. That's actually not democratic in, in when, and it's a problem, but you will fall back to it. So this building informal networks across silos and within six to nine months, if you do it properly, you can have virtually everybody within three or four degrees of separation of everybody else. And if you achieve that, you've got an ecosystem which can distribute knowledge and ideas very, very quickly in a way the formal system never can. Yeah. But there's still a formal process that okay. uh, in spite of all of the informal networks and um, the, the formal process is designed with perhaps if we can say a kind of linear approach and each silo as you describe it is uh, is thinking about its particular policy mandate and its uh, its particular aspect of the problem um isn't isn't a kind of more holistic approach needed and how do you get there well, just, yes, it's needed, but you'll never get it. You know, th th this is called realism, right? I mean, I, I've sat through countless meetings where people say, oh, we've got a holistic view. We all need to work together and pull together as one team, but I've never seen it make any real sustainable difference. So the you know, new realism, as it's called, is, okay, that's the way people work, so let's work with it rather than against it. So if you've got competing interests, you increase the density of informal networks because that will increase data flow and you reduce the time to the conflict and you make the conflict happen in a staged environment. Yeah, and you bring other people into the conflict. So for example, if we do, you've got three academics who are giving advice to government. And we also assemble PhD students who are in their camp. Then we go through three or four stages in which they interact and then have to listen. And then other people interact and they have to listen and you look for a pattern which comes out of that. So rather than have two or three weeks of multiple debates where people reinforce their position, and this is the problem, all right? The minute you get into a side of discussion, people get heavily committed to something, they won't back off. You intervene very early to force, force the interaction between them. Yeah, and then see where you go from there. So there's lots of things we can do here which recognize the evolved power structures which have developed over time and disrupt them a little bit, but not too much. Yeah. I think that I think this is for me really, really key is is working within the existing structures, but nonetheless trying to nudge them. So I think you can't make policy making holistic, uh, but you can maybe make it slightly more holistic. And you know, it, it, using some of these techniques. I mean, if we look at, I mean, some of the things happening in the Commission at the moment. I mean, do you know are, are very positive. I mean, you know it. We're talking about the twin green and digital transition. I mean, you know, trying to look at the interaction between these two mega challenges that we have at the moment, which almost transcend the pandemic. Um, or we're talking a lot about resilience. We're not just talking about recovery. We're talking about resilience and recovery. Uh, we are embedding foresight more strategically in our in our work. Um, uh, so there are, you know, I think there are reasons to be optimistic that that some of the things we're doing are going in the right track. Um, but at the same time, you know, you, at least in my conversations with the, with the policy, with the policy DGs, you know, they say, we haven't got the time for this. You know, we're too busy dealing with the here and now to be, to be doing the kind of things that Dave's talking about. Um, or you have the opposite problem or, or the additional problem that some people maybe don't know what they don't know. <laughs> they don't know that they have a problem with the way they're doing it. And so they're not very open to change. So you've got resistance to change. Now, the, the, the beauty of some of the thinking that we put in the in the field guide and the other thinking around it is that it on the one hand it opens up i think the possibility for more spaces for conversations and more awareness of methods and tools that can be used and crucially they can be used rapidly mm -hmm. i think this is that this is what i really pick up from what david is saying is that this is not something that takes you four years to do you can do it really fast and it can rapidly inform and shift your way of working and I think that if we can do more to enhance, to, to reinforce that message, then we might get more, more, more traction because that's the biggest piece of feedback I get is, you know, is it nice, but I haven't got time for it. Well, you know, <laughs> I don't think you have the choice, but, but by the way, it doesn't take a lot of time either. And I think one of the things we're, we're building the assessment process at the moment, because people like that, you know, here's something where I can say, what did I do? What do I do and do differently? But we're building it so it can be adopted very quickly, all right, and very visually. But it also recognizes this evolutionary approach. 
So it says, you know, basically asks three questions. What, you know, in you know, the EU field guide has a nice picture of all the things you need to do. So it puts those boxes up and it says, what did we do? Because we did something. And you can either feed that from a huge network of individuals or you can run it in a workshop. And then you ask three questions like, did it work? Well, if it worked, let's, let's leave that one for the moment. We've got other priorities. If it worked, but we can't do it again. So for example, we had medical staff using Facebook to share knowledge about COVID. Now they're now discovering that kind of like that's GDPR non-compliant, they've been threatened with prosecution, so they can't do that again. But it means we find another way to do that exchange, which is secure and there's areas we messed up. And this, I mean, the metaphor I often use for this is this is about use a chef approach, not a recipe book user approach. And the trouble is managers have got into, and it's not their fault, it's what the consultants have trained them to want, is any change involves a massive process. Yeah, and a linear process. And we'll have to do this, then we'll have to do this. And the reality is that, that that's never worked anyway. This says, what are we currently doing? What do we need to change? So it's more like the chef assembles different ingredients together to produce a meal in context. Then you follow a recipe. And I think Stephen made the really important point here. There are four or five things you can go and do tomorrow, which won't involve any of your time as a leader, which will give you better data. The more we can build in good design principles and robust and resilient, uh, you know, sense-making approaches, foresight approaches upstream, the better the chance we have of having the right deliverables downstream. And sometimes uh, that's where you need to push back a little bit. Um, and, and, you know, you know, there's this triangle where you can have it, you know, you can have it, um, you know, uh, good or fast or cheap, but you can only have two of the three, you know, I mean, you, you kind of sometimes need to confront politicians with some relatively simple choices, you know, you know, do you want it now, but less good, or do you want it a bit later, but, but, but actually the right thing. And I think that's, that's where the, that's where the sort of the director general sometimes has to step in and, and just sort of say it the way it is, but not always easy. Hearing. And breaking dependency cultures. I mean, we, we've done some work where we've done what are called transgenerational pairs. So those are young people with people from their grandparents' generation generating local solutions quickly. And if they come up with a good solution, they get put into a trio with somebody from government who can make the idea happen. Mm. And, and those sort of mechanisms basically reduce, reduce the amount of problems which hit the crisis level. Yeah. And I think that's the opportunity we've now got with COVID. Because one of the things it's broken is the idea that you can't engage your citizens, that city and citizens are passive recipients of policy. Yeah, they need to be engaged in the formation of the policy at the right level early enough. Yeah. And there's a great will from the citizens, as we yeah. understand, to there contribute. Is. And they are really ready for that. So how can you make the space for listening, sense-making, collective intelligence and reflection in our institutions? Because that's what we need. What would be your advice? I, th I think my advice is, I mean, it's in the field guide. I mean, we spent nine months writing this bloody stuff, so it's there, right? Excuse the language. Okay, so read the field guide. One, yes. of, the, one of the things you need to do, and this governments need to do, is you need to build sensor networks with your citizens and your civil servants. And you need those able to respond in real time. The way we talk it, you build networks for ordinary purpose. You can activate for extraordinary need. Uh, and that's also critical because you can't afford to have policy mediated by social media. That's the tyranny of the herd, you know, not the wisdom of the crowds. Okay? So one of the problems we've got with social media, it's an unbuffered feedback loop and all buff unbuffered feedback loops become perverted. If you increase the human agency in the prime sensory and you reduce the dangers of social media as well. Yeah? And I think you, you made a really important point earlier, Julie. One of the things citizens have learned through COVID is they need to be engaged and that they want to be engaged. So we need to find the mechanisms quickly before they fall back to the same cynicism that we had before. Uh, I think the, I mean, the bureaucratic answer to your question, Julie, you know, how do you make more space for sense making is, is that you kind of, you go off and you, you tell everybody in the policy sphere, you need to, you need to make more space for sense making. Um, uh, I personally think the answer, I, I think that won't work. Uh, I think the answer is that you have to show through examples and pathways how to do this. And field guide is an example. We have other practical examples like the Bauhaus project and show and so on. So I think you have to show and tell rather than tell and show, because the telling and showing 
you know, people people don't get it. But if you what you want is exemplar projects, and people come to you and say, how did you do that? And can you help me do something similar? And I think that's those practical examples are, are really where we can where we can make the difference. And so we can find these practical examples today in the Joint Research Center. You can find some in the Joint Research Center and you can find many, many more elsewhere, but we can certainly help guide people to them. Yes. Help us dream big for Europe. So what would be your your dream? I'll, I'll give you mine, I think. And I, I wrote a report for the European Union years ago on knowledge firm. And I said, Europe should not copy the states. Yeah, the states is actually multi-ethnic monocultural. The strength of Europe is multicultural and democratic. And Europe is critical in the world as a counterbalance to various forms of tyranny. And our multiculturalism should be our strength, not our weakness. I mean, I, I think it's, it's very similar to what Dave's saying, really. I think we need to remember our, our origin story, which is that we're a collective endeavor. You know, we started at the very beginning, working together on coal and steel, on, on nuclear, because it was better than working separately. And nowadays, there's a lot of pressure to, to pull everything apart. We've got individualism, we've got populism, you know, nationalism, short-sighted, short-term, everything, everything. Um, but fundamentally, the dream is that we hold on to that original goal and that, and that we're sharing for the collective good and that we're transcending borders and boundaries. I think if we can do that, that's where we can be and continue to be transformational.